to be talking about controlled remote viewing, but a very specific aspect of controlled remote viewing, which is usually not presented, which is what happens to the viewer when he or she learns controlled remote viewing? What happens once you actually experience um, the ability to retrieve non-local information? First of all, I'd like to ask you how many, actually I should ask, how many do not know anything about remote viewing? Okay, there's, there's a couple. Okay, so I do have some slides to explain it very briefly so we're all on the same page, okay? So again, uh, we're going to look at what are the psychological effects, what are the emotional and spiritual effects. What I did is I did a very informal qualitative research with 12 participants. They were actually all of my students who had done at least um, one semester of training of the military um, protocol. They came from varied backgrounds. Um, there was an engineer, there's a graphic designer, managers, IT, there were two healers and people in business. So totally varied background. Okay, so I've, um, my presentation is in four sections. The first section will just look at what controlled remote viewing is, so we're all on the same page. Second, we're going to look at the context of accessing non-local information. Just look at some of the basic um, principles that could perhaps begin to explain what it's all about. And we'll also talk about the human body, okay? Our body is our tool to access non-local information. It includes our sensories, our brain, and our heart. The third section, um, it's the verbatim comments of the participants expressing what happened to them and how it affected their life in terms of um, learning remote viewing. And the fourth is we started a um, pilot study uh, EEG pilot study, which means that when a viewer was doing session work, he'd have the EEG, and then at the times when we were sure that person was retrieving non-local information, we would look at the brain map and see what parts of the brain are lighting up, what's happening to the brain when a person is actually awake and we know for sure that they're accessing non-local information. This, to my surprise, I, I've been in CRV for about 15 years. Um, nobody has ever done this, and so I need to thank um, Dr. Richard Blasband for funding the research and also encouraging us and participating in it. So, thank you again. Okay, what is controlled remote viewing? It's about accessing non-local information. It's actually a specific, okay, controlled remote viewing, CRV, is a methodology, or rather it's called a protocol, that was developed by the U.S. government over a um, period of 20 years. They invested about $20 million, okay, this is a serious research project. They employed the best psychologists, physicists, psychics, okay, and they developed a method to access non-local information. What you need to remember is that this protocol was developed not for psychic people, it was developed for the general um, soldier, military personnel, okay. What it does is it elicits the natural intuitive skills that we already have, and it provides a structure. The structure is important because it, it enables you to manage the flow of non-local information. So you might wonder why the U.S. government did this, or you probably have a very good suspicion. Uh, what happened is back in the days when we didn't have sophisticated satellites for spying, um, the Russians were getting incredibly detailed information from the U.S. and the U.S. couldn't figure out how, how are they getting this? And then they found out that the Russians were developing, they were hiring, they, they weren't bashful, okay? In the U.S. they were bashful to say, we are looking for psychics. In Russia, they went and probably forced them to come in and work for them. And then they researched the whole process and started developing a method to enhance the psychic skills. So the American government saw that and they said, aha, you know, 
we weren't going to do it, but you know the Americans, they were going to do it better. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's, that's in brief the background, but uh, I can tell you it's a very, very powerful protocol. Okay, here's um, a quote from Dr. Russell Targ, who is a physicist. Okay, I'm going to present today as much, as many quotations from the science community as I can, okay? He was the, one of the founders of SRI, or the Stanford Research Institute, which um, developed, helped develop the protocol with the government. But he is a physicist, okay? And he says, without a doubt, people can learn to use their intuitive consciousness in a way that transcends conventional understanding of space and time to describe and experience places and events that are blocked from our ordinary perception. So the ability of using our brain to access non-local information has been repeatedly um, demonstrated through scientific research. And if you're interested, I recommend you look up the Princeton Peer Lab, who spent at least 20 years um, looking into this type of phenomenon. OK, so that's fine. That's you know the principle of CRV. But I mean, how do you do it? What does it look like? How does it work? Okay. The person who will be doing the session, we call them the viewer, okay? The viewer will go to a specific place, geographic um, location, and view what's happening there or describe what's happening there, okay? So first of all, you have to tell the person where you want them to go. How do you do that, okay? Here's an example. Let's say person A will um, we'll take a photo of a place that has some of the description around it because the person will be describing not just that object that's in the photo, but he or she may be describing, for example, in this case, the coastline. And so you want to make sure that you have information uh, in the context of the specific thing that's in the photo. So, person A will identify a photo randomly, anything, it could be, and I always use this, um, this example, it could be a monkey eating a banana, or it could be the, you know, the Empire State Building. In this case, this is what it is. The person will then randomly, randomly, okay, choose a set of numbers, whatever comes through your head. That will label that photo. Okay, that becomes the label for this target. The photo is put in this envelope that has the numbers on it, okay? And then person A will give these numbers to person B, who could be me, okay? And I don't know what's in the envelope, I just know those numbers. And I will give those numbers to person C, who is the viewer, okay? So I don't know what the photo is. And the viewer will begin to describe the target. The viewer, you must remember, will not view, is not supposed to view the photo. The viewer is going to, the photo is a beacon. It tells the person, this is what I want you to view. The person will go at the time in the location that the photo was taken. Okay, so that brings up a few questions. How does it work? How does that work? Does anybody know? If you do, I think you'll probably win a Nobel Prize. There's all sorts of research trying to figure out how does this work. Okay, here's what a session looks like. The viewer will have a piece of blank paper, those of you who come to my um, workshop um, will learn how to do this. It's a piece of blank paper and you will already have learned the protocol. And this is just to, to give you a visual of what happens. You see these numbers here, okay, that's the target. That's the number that represents the target. And then you start off with ideograms, okay? Ideograms is your own language. You begin, you learn in remote viewing how to develop your own language between your conscious and unconscious part of the mind. So 
when you initially go on a target, you just get sort of general perceptions. And what's really important is to immediately, immediately record perceptions, as vague as they may be in the beginning. Why? Because what happens is that your conscious mind, okay, who has been in charge all of its life, and, and I'll talk more about this later in the presentation, is going to want to give an explanation or, you know, um, build a story with the impressions that you get. So you have to hurry and write everything down because if you start thinking about it, you're going to lose it and your conscious mind is going to say, that can't be possible, it's not true. Don't even bother writing it down because you know it's not right. And before you know it, you can have a student that, you know, after three minutes, is just staring at the paper and not writing anything. Because it's like, I can't, no, no, no. And, you know, sometimes it goes to, it's sort of funny because everybody learns it in a different way. And it all depends upon your character. And I remember this was in Helsinki, I had a student who, after the third try, the third session, she couldn't even write her name because you write your name on top. And she was like, uh, I said, well, you can at least write your name. <laughs> I think you, you know, you're still who you are. <laughs> so it really, like I said, it's, it's quite powerful. So anyhow, so you start like this and then, you know, you, you go back and you start describing that ideogram. So that was my ideogram for biological, okay? Uh, biological means um, either human or animal. So you start describing, for me it was many, there was a cluster, it was noisy and all that. And um, you just continue, it's, it's a protocol that has, um, well, yeah. So for example, in phase one, this is just to show you how um, tricky the conscious is. When you, you're only supposed to describe or use um, adjectives, okay, at first, because you're just entering into the target. And, for example, if you get white, tall, smooth, your conscious is going to say, I know what it is, it's a church. And usually, at that stage of phase two, the nouns are always wrong because you're busy getting true impressions, accurate impressions, and your conscious mind is going to say, I know what that is, and you don't, and make you. So, every time we have a noun, we write it on the right hand side because they're usually um, they're usually wrong. Okay, so the protocol has six phases, and as we move through it, the more detail and definition of impressions are obtained. Okay. Okay, here's an example of one of my students. Okay, at the end of um, you can't see this very well. Can you see? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't know why. It's the first time it doesn't appear very well. Okay, so she, she had a very um, difficult time. I think it took her like two months before she actually got on target. And it's not that she did not get on target. She actually did, but as soon as she got like three or four impressions, oh my God, she had a whole story. A whole story. And on top of it, she was an artist. So she'd send me like these elaborate, beautiful, you know, um, drawings of, it had nothing to do with the target. But then I would look at her impressions that she wrote down and many of them were accurate. So one day she says, okay, Dominique, here's another one. And she was laughing. She says, yeah, I bet it's the Empire State Building this time. Well, here was the target. Okay. <laughs> So, what's interesting here is that, um, you see, the angle, she did not um, draw the turtle at the same angle as the photo. And to me, that was an indication that she did not psychically view the photo, because she came in on a target from a different angle and just drew what she saw, or what she felt. Okay, so that's one way of determining if the student is just psychically going into the envelope, and that's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, all right, that's, so what is non-local information? Where is it? You know, what sort of system do we live in? Well, um, like I briefly mentioned yesterday, the ancient science of radiesthesia is that everything gives out a unique energetic imprint, but into a different realm, 
than our material reality. Okay? In that other realm, there is no time and there is no distance. Okay? There is here, you know, I have to reach out and pick this up and, and there is time, but there's another realm where it, you know, it doesn't happen. So the human potential has the capability to tune into this network and integrate this skill into our normal cognitive process. It's just a skill that we have totally ignored for thousands of years and I, I believe we have to reawaken it. So there are, in, in my um, view, there are no concepts yet that explain how everything works, of course, but one of the concepts, um, the holographic principle, I think, comes pretty close to it as a partial and as a step one of explaining it on a scientific level. Okay, as you may or may not know, the cosmic hologram operates on two different levels. There's the visual or the photograph whereby each part contains all the information, but there's also the vibrational level of a hologram where the information is stored, okay, in a, like a time-space event matrix. Again, the physicist Rush, Russell Targ said that our reality is a hologram whereby each region of space-time contains information about every other point in space-time. This information is readily available to our awareness. In the holographic universe of David Baum, there's a unity of consciousness, a greater collective mind with no boundaries of space or time. And I read, I think it was in January or February in Scientific American, that um, the latest findings indicate that information is stored at the edge or horizon of holographic systems. When, this is something that they're still looking into. When a black hole implodes, information doesn't disappear. The information they think may be found at the edge of it or in at the horizon. So there's all sorts of quantum physics uh, concepts that come into play here. Entangled particles, wormholes, tunnelings, photons, okay? The bottom line is that particles continue to communicate with each other instantaneously. No matter what the distance, they're still in communication. Professor David Baum, whom I'm sure you've all heard about from Princeton, says, the reason subatomic particles are able to remain in contact with one another, regardless of the distance between them, is not because they are sending off signals. So, forget that. It's because their separateness is an illusion. These particles are not individual entities, they're actually extensions of the same fundamental something that we can't define very well. So the concept of separation has been created by us, by us humans, but I think it's, um, it's more of a projection because we're living in this material reality where time and space and distance does exist and so we're projecting, oh, if there's another realm, where is time? Where is distance? Because, you know, if it's true here, I think that's the mistake that um, we're making. Here's a, a really fascinating experiment that was conducted um, back in 1993 by the Army Intelligence and Security Command in the U.S. So the white blood cells were taken from the cheek of somebody sitting in a room. They put the cells in a centrifuge and test tube with a polygraph probe, okay, in the test tube, and they brought it into another room. The person sitting in the room was watching videos, and every time there was a violent scene or they showed him a, a violent um, video, he would react, and guess what? The cells in the test tubes reacted immediately also. So, of course, they repeated, they replicated the experiments 
and they separated it 50 miles, okay? Distance didn't matter, it still worked. Then they tested about time, and they said, well, how long, you know, are these connected? Are these cells connected to the donor? Two days later, they still responded. The cells remained energetically and non-locally connected to their donor and seemed to remember who the donor was. You know, think of that, too. So what are the implications in terms of CRV? We're here to talk about CRV. Well, the protocol, okay, enables our unconscious energy field to connect into or to travel through this cosmic system in order to obtain information. So, all we have is our body, okay? It's our only tool, really. And when you think about it, we were, we came on this planet with this body, which is quite a, a complex and, and could be refined instrument, but we don't have a manual. Nobody told us about this. Nobody, you know, we don't really know how to use it. So we need to look into that. We need to explore our human potential and, you know, go further. So when you look at our tool, there's the physical body, but there's also the subtle energy fields that we, we have the capability of interacting with and using. So we use our sensory abilities when you learn controlled remote viewing, just like when you learn radiesthesia, the ancient science, okay? It was all about developing your sensitivities or sensibilities, okay? Both physically and in terms of energy, okay? And what we do is we use these abilities with intention. Intention is critical, okay? And that could be another lecture in itself. How do you develop intention, okay? How do you, you know, how do you um, make it travel somewhere? You have to keep a clear mind. You have to know how to ask questions or phrase your intentions. They have to be very clear and very quick, okay? But that's how we interact with that non-local realm. And again, as I said yesterday, the human body is both an emitter and receptor. Let's look at the heart. And here, Antonella, you're going to recognize your slides. I told you um, yeah. that we had like the same slides yesterday. So, so as um, there's, sorry, I forgot. Yeah, there's a new science called neurocardiology. Roland McCready, who's a PhD at the, oh, it's not heat math, it's heart math. Sorry, there's a typo. <laughs> I, um, if, I recommend that if you're interested in knowing more about this, you look up heart math. Institute there in California. And um, Roland McCready is uh, the person who did most of the research. He found that the heart receives most of non-local information and sends the messages to the brain. And so with intention and by developing our sensory abilities, we enhance the quality of reception. Again, I use the same um, sentence that you did. The heart is more than just a pump, okay? It's an intrinsic and sophisticated nervous system with 40,000 neurons or sensory neurites, okay? It has its own neurotransmitters, protein. It's an elaborate circuitry that acts independently from the head brain. The heart can learn, can remember, can feel, can sense. It's like, whoa, gee, I didn't realize there was somebody else here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it has several direct pathways to the head brain, so it can tell the brain what to think or what to do. Okay. It signals, signals to the medulla continue up to the higher centers of the head brain, and they influence the heart signals, influence perception, decision making, and other cognitive processes. The heart's electromagnetic field is by far the most powerful rhythmic field produced in the human body, and it envelops all the cells of our body. It also extends out in all directions outside of us. Again, on the HeartMath website, you can find the research paper that they've done on that. They're able to measure, okay, outside of the body, the heart field, 
Okay. Also, the heart's field is an important carrier of information. When humans touch or are in conversational proximity of each other, the heartbeat signal is registered in the other person's brain waves. Think of that. When you get close to a person, you know, you're actually sort of, um, what's it called, entangling at a certain level. It appears that the heart receives most of the signals from non-local information, sends it to the brain. But here's the problem. The brain is able to process only a very small percentage of the information because there are signals. Not only you know, do we not know what they mean, but un unless you know you're getting these signals, you ignore them to begin with. So this is a very important um, piece of knowledge. The heart is in a constant two-way dialogue with the brain. The heart is sending more, far more signals to the brain than the brain is sending to the heart. So going back to CRV, okay, when you think about it, CRV develops the process in a language to capture the signals and then to derive meaning from these signals. So when you learn CRV, you need to, you know, to visualize or acknowledge that your heart has a big um, role in this. Let's look at the brain um, in terms of neuroplasticity. Okay, Prigogine, in um, the 77 Nobel Prize winner in thermodynamics, says the brain operates as a dissipative structure, which means that as we learn new skills, the brain continually self-organizes to a higher level in order to accommodate the change or accommodate an increased use of a specific function. Therefore, the system escapes into a higher order. And this is good news for all of us, is that 70-year-old humans can still produce new neurons. So don't think because you're a certain age that you can say, oh, I don't want to learn anything and just, you know, watch TV. Uh-uh, that's not an excuse. Okay? So, the brain doesn't simply learn. It is always learning how to learn. The brain is more like a living creature with an appetite, one that can grow and change itself with proper nourishment and exercise. Okay? And this is from... Dr. Merz Zanik from John Hopkins, okay? So here it gives you, you know, a, a little bit of an impression of, of the human potential and how, you know, we really haven't, haven't looked at it and, and tried to develop it. So going back again to CRV, what is the implication um, in terms of brain plasticity? Well, when you think about it, CRV develops, first of all, your strength in creating and sending intention in the non-local realm. It develops a language inside your brain between the conscious and the unconscious. You develop your abilities, and then you learn how to integrate all this into like a new system. So, in essence, CRV pushes our brain activity beyond the normal level that you're used to. And therefore, according to Prigogine, our brain reconstructs to a higher level to accommodate new skills. One of the reasons, or I should say probably the reason I teach CRV is not so people can have fun and say, oh, look what I can do. It is fun and it is important and it's quite an experience. But the real value in learning CRV you can begin to understand is that you start developing your human potential. Okay, before I go any further, um, I'd like to define a few terms. Um, and there are different schools of thoughts about defining conscious, subconscious, and unconscious. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. We're just using these words as labels, okay? So when I refer to the conscious, I mean the part of the brain that analyzes, makes judgments. It's a part of the brain that's been in charge all of our lives. We've developed it, okay? It's been making all our decisions. It's Mr. Big Boss, uh, has a big ego, and it knows everything, okay? Then you have the subconscious, and that's where you store all of your emotions, life experiences, any programs, or whatever. 
And then the unconscious is where is the portal to non-local realm. And that's where you get the insights, intuition, it's the connection to the holographic system. Okay. Now I needed to define these because um, the CRV protocol, okay, what it does, and that's where the power is, okay. You know how you, when you get you get an idea or you get an insight and go, wow, that where did I get that from? Well, do you ever get that old voice that says, oh really, you really think that's right? And do you get that voice that says, where'd that come from? It can't be true, okay? This is what we're dealing with when we work with psychic skills, when we learn how to access non-local information. Not only do we have to develop the skill to capture the signals, but once we get them, we have to fight off our conscious brain, Mr. Big Boss, who knows it all, and says, uh-uh, I did not generate this information, therefore it does not exist. Or if it does, you know, I'm going to tell you something more about it because I know more. So that's what the CRV protocol does. It teaches you, it's a method, to try for a while to separate the two. So that when you increase the flow of non-local information, the conscious mind, we're going to keep it busy doing something. Okay? We know it has a big ego. We know it loves to take over projects. So the CRV protocol is actually a very important project for the conscious mind. Remember I showed you what, um, what it looks like, you know, with the different phases? Well, it looks quite complicated, and, and it is, okay? Because there are six phases, and each time you go to the left, then you go to the right, then you move down, then you have, at one point, you have eight columns, and, and, and it's such, you know, so difficult to remember what to do that Mr. Conscious here is having a field day and managing, you know, how you're going to use this protocol. And so by doing that, by concentrating on what is it I do next, then your unconscious is free to access more non-local information. Okay? So here's what we're about. Yeah, so here's what happens, okay? Enter some non-local information out of the blue, as we say, and it's not from the conscious, it's not logical, it's not rational. Their conscious is going to have a huge reaction, it feels insulted, it's losing control, okay? And then you have a battle on your hands. This is the battle that you're going to have, learning, control, remote viewing, or any other method to access non-local information. Mr. Big Boss gets really upset. So, I've already said that. Um, yeah, so, as I mentioned before, part of um, training for remote viewing is to refine your, your sensitivities. Just like, you know, I'm sorry, I'm terrible with names, but um, this morning you showed us how to feel, you know, energies and all that. This is very important, okay? So, we learn how to do this in this reality so that when we go to, into the non-local realm, we're already more developed and we'll be able to be more sensitive to the subtle energies and to picking up non-local information and bringing it back. So there's a lot of exercises that we do in your everyday life to develop your sensitivities. Okay, so actually, yeah, the protocol is a door to our cosmic part. Okay, so. What happens, imagine this, and maybe you don't need to imagine it because probably, has anybody done CRV training here? Does, oh well, yes, Robert, you have. Robert is one of my best former students. <laughs> so, and you have to, somebody else raise it. Okay, good. Well, for those of you who have not, okay, just imagine this, you're sitting at a desk in front of a blank piece of paper, you learn to follow the protocol, and it's a real pain, so you go through the motions and all that, and you're getting impressions through your, your brain, and your monitor keeps saying, write it down, write it down, so you write it down, and you go, yeah, 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 and then all of a sudden, you finished, somebody shows you the target, and you got accurate information, just by sitting here. You didn't meditate, you didn't do mushrooms, you didn't do anything. 
You were wide awake. You had a cup of coffee. You're totally, you know, awake. So, what does that do? What does that do to your sense of reality? There's a little shift there all of a sudden, right? Not only is it proof that you can access non-local information, but the simplicity of it. You just, you know, it's like learning how to play the piano. Or for me, learning how to do mathematics, except I, I was never good at it, so. <laughs> but it's the same type of thing, okay? We have this skill, and we've ignored it. But the problem is, I, I believe, is that it's been dormant for generations and generations and generations, and so it's, it's going to take a, it takes a big effort to reawaken it, but it is absolutely possible. So what did the viewer actually experience? <clears throat> Travel in time-space, connection with the universe, communication with the unconscious. There's got to be a change in perception of reality, okay? And here is where CRV is, is quite different in that it provides um, a person with the experience versus me standing here and explaining to you, you know, what happens, yeah, 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 it's good. you know, you go away. But when you actually experience it yourself, thinking that I can't do this to begin with, then, then that's quite powerful. Okay, so what happens? It, in effect, it's a tear through the fabric of our perceived reality. It was our reality, but, you know, it's no longer the same. So here's what happens, I found over the years of teaching control remote viewing. There are two types of, of reaction. Either someone learns it, and the ego takes over, and it's like, wow, look at what I can do. And all they, they actually get addicted to doing session work. They gotta do one like every other day to prove to themselves and to their friends, look what I can do. And also because CRV is is because we we can't develop it yet, whereby we can be one hundred percent correct one hundred percent of the time. You will do some session works that are really terrible, and then you'll get one where, you know, like the turtle. So there's also this they get into this addiction of wanting to have a perfect target, a perfect session. And that's it. That's all they do with it. But then I have other students who really get it, that moment where, whoa, they understand what just happens. And that, in that case, okay, triggers a significant transformational process. And that's um, what we're going to look at in, in my um, research. Okay? So, Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I got the needles inverted. Okay, is it 22? All right, I'm just going to go very quickly through the verbatim um, comments because I want to make sure I have time to look at the EEG pilot study. So here are some of the emergent themes to um, people who learn CRV. There's a very interesting thing, initial confusion, okay? They can't find words when speaking after starting to learn CRV, and this is something that I've experienced big time, and I think that, you know, I still do. And I think I figured out why. It's because, think about it, you're developing a new language between your conscious and unconscious, but also receiving signals from the non-local realm. So when you're learning something, you become immersed in it, and it becomes the norm, okay? And so, especially when you use that, every day, okay, because you can't shut off your sensories, and then all of a sudden you have to come back to this, you know, language, human language, which is a totally different system, okay, and you're using your brain in a totally different way than when you're communicating with the non-local realm. So many of my students experience that, it's all of a sudden, we know what we want to say, we can feel it, but the, the, we have to, like, we can feel, we need to go to that part of the brain where the word is. So there's an adaptation um, period. Um, there's also an increase in um, synchronicities or flow of events. Now, I'm not sure if the synchronicities um, uh, increase or if it's because the person has become more sensitive and aware and, and they begin to see the synchronicities. I don't know what it is. 
Intuitive insights increase our connection to the universe, our sense of awe and responsibility. Um, there's also a lot of times, of course, a social disconnect. I can't talk to anybody about this. I think that's the purpose of, of this whole um, conference here is that, you know, we're into areas where it's not easy that you can go up to someone and say, hey. <laughs> so, um, you know, my friends don't believe me. My family thinks I'm crazy. I have nobody to talk to. And then because, you know, of this increased awareness and connection, um, what happens is that you develop a clarity. You develop a clarity about yourself and about your life and about the universe you live in. And then you begin, you can't tolerate uh, murkiness in your life anymore. Your tolerance for anything that's not clear becomes really low. And so a lot of people, I, I can't tell you how many um, of my students um, have made big life changes in, um, because and attribute it to their training. So let's look for a few verbatim comments from, um, from the participants. A sense of no time and space. The realization that I can go anywhere and see anything Experiencing a session when I was literally floating over a mountain valley and seeing everything that was there to see was both awe-inspiring and adrenaline pumping, to say the least. When you really, and I mean really, start to understand the entanglement of everything, when you see and feel the connectedness of the universe, then the world never looks the same again. How could I ever hurt another human being? or living thing when I know, when I feel connected to them. The connectedness I now feel has allowed me a sense of peace. I almost can see and understand the ebb and flow or negative and positive actions in the universe around me and in everyday life. Many participants also express a sense of power, but also responsibility. You now realize you can go anywhere and literally see anything in your mind's eye. You feel there is nothing that you cannot do or nowhere you cannot go. I heard somewhere that with awesome power comes awesome responsibility. And that immediately reverberated in my thoughts. So this is the type of um, reactions you know, I got from the participants. Um, Whoops, okay, I have to skip through and just tell you briefly about the EEG experiments. Um, okay, so, first of all, why, you know, why am I interested in doing EEG experiments? Well, I would like to demonstrate that um, or find out whether or not my um, theory is correct that Accessing non-local information is a natural function of the brain. Okay, we don't have to meditate, we don't have to do hemisync, we don't have to do mushrooms or whatever else you want to do. You just get a good night's sleep, have a nice cup of coffee and get to it. Just like you would learn math or learn to play the piano. So what, what I've done is, and, and it's never um, been done before, okay, is to... I think you just... Oh, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, this um, this has never been done before, and what I'm focusing on when somebody is doing a session, because I know what the target is, I know when a person is on target or not. Here was viewer number three. He was in Sausalito at Dr. Blasband's office, and I was in Denver monitoring with Skype. <laughs> so, um, so here's what he described. Okay, all I gave him was numbers, random numbers, and he started describing aircraft, military, extreme speed. He described the angle of the craft. There were rows of seats inside, glass windows. He was smelling exhaust fumes and from an engine, he said it was from an engine and he even said I think he was like 200 yards away from the engine. He says, oh, it's strange. He says, I see trees and a road below. He started to describe a pilot in uniform and rank and this was um, the target. It was a Russian MiG airplane. 
He then apologized before he saw the photo and said, you know, I think there's an inscription on, on the plane, but I'm, I'm so, I can't make it up. He was so frustrated because he couldn't make it up, but he knew it was there. <laughs> okay, so we knew he was on target, okay? And that's him looking at his session work and looking at the target. This was viewer number one. She had accurate impressions, square, black, smooth, space, vast space. It was cold, it was high. There were pipes and rods and a lot of vertical things. And this was, um, this was the target, the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge, okay? So I need to tell you that we're still waiting for the final analysis. What I'm giving you are the preliminary comments from the person who did the EEG, who said that in these two viewers, okay, he was very surprised because he expected something very different. He said the brain was hyperactive and multitasking, really, really, you know, powerfully. The olfactory part of the brain was lighting up when the viewer was smelling exhaust. He was sitting right here, and he says, I smell exhaust fume. The brain was recognizing as if it was true exhaust fumes, okay? There was hypersynchronicity. The brain was going in many different directions, and there was a hyperconnectivity. It was completely different than the baseline. Then we had viewer number three, and this is a funny one, okay? So um, she started describing lollipops, a circus, a huge Ferris wheel, holiday, free joy, and she was so happy as she was doing the session work. And she said, oh, I see a large park. Oh, it's the size of Marin Fairground and all that. And here was the target. In my view, the target was the Louvre Museum in Paris. And when she started saying, there's a Ferris wheel and there's, and I'm like, what? And then I remembered there's a huge amusement park just adjacent to the Louvre Museum. What happens in controlled remote viewing, which is why you have a monitor, is that you will go to an aspect of the target that you like. If there's a place you don't like, you're not going to go there. So she landed there and said, oh, I'm going to go over there. And she described the whole amusement park. So, you know, she, she was on target, that's for sure. And she had a good time, I was jealous. <laughs> so this is what it looks like, you know, in EEG. Uh, in her case, okay, there was an increased delta power, a marked reduction of theta and alpha power compared to the baseline and control visual. And from Dr. Acosta's um, statement, he said the big surprise was that there was robust increased delta power. So again, you know, these are not, we're still waiting for the analysis, it's only three people, but it's never been done before, okay? And um, so we're actually seeking funding to continue this research because I think it, it could really um, be valuable to, you know, developing the human potential and maybe, you know, even the, the human consciousness. So the um, EEG is not the ideal because if you move too much, then there are artifacts. So there may be something better like the fMRI, but then we get into huge costs and how do you do session work in a machine lying down? So, you know, <laughs> there's a few things here. We also need to check the heart coherence because the heart has a very important uh, role in this. As a matter of fact, viewer number three that I showed you um, after doing CRV for a whole year with me, has now noticed that when he's on target, he gets heart palpitations. And so now every time he does such a work and he gets a little heart palpitation, it's a signal that he's most probably on target. So, what if? What if we could train our mind to integrate connectivity to non-local non realm into our normal thinking process? naturally, without external prompts, without taking substances. What would happen to a decision-making process? Think about it. You have access to the future. You, have, you can start forecasting. Imagine, I mean, I can just imagine these, you know, CEOs, these business people, you know, going into forecasting. I mean, it could create chaos, maybe. But, you know, just think about it. It would change so much of the way we think. 
so much in the way we make our decisions, would it trigger a shift in human consciousness when you read the verbatim comments of my, of my um, participants, how, you know, they were touched, oh, yeah, done? No, ten. Ten oh, ten. minutes. Oh, I have ten minutes, okay, good, <laughs> thank you. Um, you know, it's a very personal experience, and it's a very powerful one. And so, if it could trigger a shift in human consciousness in each person one at a time, that could be very powerful too. And therefore, could it trigger some sort of evolution of mankind, which I just personally feel we really need. <laughs> so, and that's it. Thank you. Grazie. <laughs> So I touched possibly because of shortage of time on the time shifting part of this work, although you mentioned oh. it in passing. Yes. And I have one other question. Mm -hmm. With the life changing and consciousness raising aspects of this, how does someone trained in the military oh. manage to stay yes. on task with the yes. possibly questionable goals of the so called military industrial yes. combine at the end of? Yeah. Two good questions. The first one, in terms of time, and, um, time, or what was your question? Um, when you're on, you hit to that time. Okay. Yeah. Aspects of the okay. Time. When you're on target, okay, you can give yourself what we call move commands, and say move back 30 years and describe what you see. Move ahead 50 years. Describe what you see. If you read any of the um, CRV books by the military men, I think it's McMonagall, but I'm not sure. Um, he wrote, he was given a target and he described something, um, he was working for the military, and he described something in Russia whereby they, he described a, a sort of a submarine that they were building and all that. And they said, oh, no, 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 we actually have photos. You're totally off. They're not doing that. And so we got all upset. And 20 years later, they came, um, they saw his session work because they were cleaning out their desk or something. And they saw this, and he had actually viewed it into the future for something that had not, and he had been totally accurate. And to answer the second part of your question, well, you know, that's a, yeah, I mean, um, some military, um, you'll have to read the history of it. I mean, you know, I don't have the time to answer, but there, there's a very good book, um, and email me or remind me to give it to you. It's called, um, I think, Psychic Spies, and um, I can't remember the name of the author, but it will give you, it will answer that question in the whole book. <laughs> it sounds like you wouldn't actually like the title of Psychic Spies, would you? Well, so what said at the beginning. yeah, yeah, well, uh, what, <laughs> I know, it's got uh, yes. Does it mean, if you can move to the future, does it mean that the future is predetermined? It, does it mean that the future is what? Predetermined. Predetermined. Oh, well, that's, that's another lecture. <laughs> totally. Uh, absolutely. I mean, all these questions come up. I don't know. I, I vacillate from one concept to the other as I do more and more of this work. I realize that I realize that there is a whole realm or concept that we cannot even begin to imagine yet. Remember when the Earth was flat and we did all our scientific, you know, research based on, of course, a huge assumption the Earth is flat. Okay, I think we're, we're at that stage here where we're making some assumptions and can't see what we don't, can't even, we don't even have the tool to imagine it. But that's, yes? Why the military decided to make a problem with this type of reserves? Oh, uh, yeah, good question. In general, uh, they keep their yeah. own reserves for yeah. The question is, why did, um, why was the CRV protocol made public? Nobody really knows, except that I've been told by a few of the um, military people it was something very stupid in the legal language. 
and uh, they didn't, they forgot to put something that says, you know, indefinitely it can't go out or something like that. And so it did. But if you read the history of it, as soon as it came out, there was all sorts of um, PR work done by the military saying that it doesn't work. It's interesting to so read they about. they said that the meter doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, they came out and said, no, we didn't really do that. Oh, we did, but it didn't work. Don't. You know, it's... Yeah. 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 And uh, this person? Just oh. Yeah. Uh, Does the military still do this? Is the military still using this? Yes. Or the yes, they are. Not only that, but, okay, if you study CRV and begin to evolve with it, you see the potential that it has. And the military is way beyond this already. So, but they still use it. Yes, I, I know. Yes. Yes? I have two questions. One, uh, regarding the methodology that you use to develop or train people, uh, do you provide feedback to the experimenter right after the leakage? Yes, and it's very important to do that immediately. And what we do is we disconnect. It's very important to do a disconnect. There have been um, viewers who have gotten into some really serious emotional situations because they stay connected, they stay entangled. You don't know what type of person you've entangled with over there. So you do a simple disconnect and then you immediately show the viewer the feedback. Now that's in training. I've done some police work um, to search for, you know, dead bodies or whatever, criminals, and they never give you feedback because they don't want to tell anybody that they're using you. So you don't get paid and you don't get feedback. So you do that for a while and then you go, I think I can do something better with my time. <laughs> so, uh, yes? You, you have you gave the description of putting a photograph in, in, a, in an envelope that was not seen by the person searching you. Now, that, that is sort of more like a military type of application. If they would put a picture of a, a Soviet uh, base in, the, in there and you would take the same. But if you wanted to find out about something yourself, like let us say, uh, what is in this particular village, uh, and you wanted to know, yep. you yourself wanted to know that, what would you do there? Well, then you just decide and write on the paper and we call it tasking and task yourself. The reason we put it in the envelope is so that it's totally objective. You know that you haven't, you know, if you see the photo, then your conscious mind will immediately start describing it. You don't want your conscious mind to describe it. And that's the danger. If you task yourself on something, it's very difficult to be totally objective and shut off that conscious voice. That's, uh, yes? In uh, uh, developing this type of procedure, the military uh, did make a reference to a device developed in the 60s called the chronovisor or chronovisor in time. No, no, no. That is a device, in the theory of the, of the base is the same, that mm -hmm. you reported that was developed by physicists and some priests in, in the 60s, uh, was developed a device in which uh, you, I don't know, Method, you uh, turn this device in a certain period on a certain side, and you can see on that, on it, that, uh, what happened at that time. Now it is said, it is said, it is, uh, it is uh, found at the Vatican, uh, far from here, uh, archives, uh, is there, waiting for uh, developing of the humans. Uh, so yes, there is I've heard about that, and that it's, it's I can't remember what it is, but what really but shocked me is that it's the Vatican who has it. But you can find books uh, by, written by physicists, by physicists uh, in which uh, they report very clearly and very, very accurate way what you uh, explain just by, by words, by mm -hmm. word. and uh, it's in, it does exist. And so yep. there is some connection with I, I don't know. Um, as, as far as I know, um, I don't know everything, but I don't think they were influenced by that. But who knows, because we don't know. We're just the public. 
So, but thank you. That's a yeah interesting there comment. Some books oh, I'd love to uh, ask you afterwards. Yes. Four days ago, my partner Jackie dropped her dowsing pendulum. We didn't realise until we'd driven 30 miles. And in fact, we had to divert back to check on the way back just in case, unsuccessfully. And it later turned up rolling on the car seat. But would a practitioner be able to use this technique to just go? Yes. Yeah, save yeah. Of a good uh, remote viewer, yeah, find the missing pendulum type of thing. You can task yourself. What you need to know, though, and I know my time is way over and I'm going to shut up, but um, what you need to know is that you, it doesn't always work upon command, okay? You'll have a session where, you know, you find the pendulum, then you have a session where you get nothing, and then you'll get another session where, that's why I want to do the EEG to, to see, you know, to find out. And so, and to develop the skill so that we can manage it. We can say, I feel like playing the piano now. I feel like getting non-local information now. Why can't we do that? If we can do it so accurately, randomly, once in a while, there, we're on to something here. But I just want to, you know, let you know that this is not a magic. Uh, there are times where you won't get correct information.